This meeting of the Waco ISD Board of Trustees is hereby called to order. A quorum is present in person in the Waco ISD Administration Building. This meeting is also available as a video and audio conference in accordance with the governor's suspended rules related to COVID-19. In accordance with those rules, we certify that members of the public may attend in person. Members of the public attending in person may sign up to offer public comments on the agenda, as is our normal, normal practice. Members who, of the public who are not attending in person were given instructions about how to submit comments to Joshua Wucher by 10 o'clock last night. Members of the board not physically present in the boardroom. I don't think, I think everybody's going to be here tonight though, right? Um, all items to be discussed or voted upon have been posted in accordance with state law. If you have questions about the suspended open meeting requirements, please contact the Office of the Attorney General by calling 888-672-6787 or by emailing toma at oag.texas.gov. At this time, the board will go into closed session in accordance with Texas Government Code Chapter 551.074 uh, regarding personnel matters. And no action will be taken, and we will return. Um, it, do you think we'll be out before 7? Oh, yeah, 645 to 7 o'clock. All right, the board is reconvening in open session. Um, no action was taken in closed session. And at this time, on our agenda is public comments, but it's my understanding we didn't receive any, and we don't have anybody signed up. Okay. Uh, so next is a review and discuss long-range facilities planning. Dr. Kim Cannon. Sure. This is um, the board's opportunity to discuss the um, community advisory committee in the process for uh, developing our facilities master plan. Our last meeting was on March the 1st, and that feels like it's been a little while, um, but it really wasn't that long ago. So I just wanted to see what stood out to you. Um, as you'll recall, we had a, a, our night was spent talking about Waco High School, and um, the committee landed pretty solidly on um, rebuilding Waco High School. So I just wanted to give you all an opportunity um, to talk about the meeting and anything you wanted to share or any thoughts and questions. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I was, I wasn't surprised, but I was impressed with how quickly we landed on that scenario. Mm -hmm. Pretty much uh, from the first group to the last group when we reported out mm -hmm. from the breakout sessions. Uh, very consistent remarks. Uh, uh, very thorough remarks in terms of um, items of concern and and how we get from A to B and Z uh, all the way through the process. So up and up and up to and including, you know, comments on the Fine Arts Center, mm -hmm. you know, how that will be uh, handled and what have you, you know, from the site plan that we saw that they lasered in on that as well. So uh, very impressed with with how the the group uh, really reinforced each other throughout that process and just, uh, you know, echoed the same thing throughout. So we got a lot of meaningful information, I think, out of useful, meaningful information out of those. Uh, Mr. President, Mrs. President, uh, I, I concur with uh, Mr. Sykes. And, and um, I'm very happy to see that people realize that just start putting money into patch up Waco High was going was going to be a waste of money. I think I know everybody in the group I was in they realized that uh, what they say you throwing good money behind bad money or whatever. So it was going to be a total waste of time. And uh, seemed like that everybody in the meeting that night they realized that let's just start from scratch and start all over again. So I appreciate that. I think um, it also rebuilding gives us an opportunity to work on design and to change spaces for instruction and reorganize where things are. And so I'm in, uh, excited about that. Mrs. Tickle. 
Uh, I think, uh, I, I kind of want to echo what Dr. King Cannon said. I really, I think I was encouraged, number one, by the excitement still and the enthusiasm that I really saw people sharing, you know, as they reimagined kind of a new way go high. And I think uh, uh, that um, element of innovation, of kind of having a blank slate to be able to really innovate for our campuses and look at spaces in a new way that would really serve our students in a, a you know, what, uh, kind of this 21st century, um, w serve them in a way that they would be beneficial to them and would prepare them for, you know, their next stage of life. And so I just, yeah, I really, I really think um, the long-term planning, long-range planning, I think it's been um, encouraging. I would say that. I would say it's been really encouraging mm -hmm. to, to hear from people within our community and their buy-in uh, towards Wake ISD. You know, I think <laughs> sometimes you can hear um, negative things or kind of these kind of sidebar comments, but, you know, when we, when we get together and we really talk, the community is so behind Waco ISD. And I think I, I feel that same thing from our city, and it is just really encouraging. I'm really excited. I think we've got, we're starting to gain some good momentum here. So, And I, I don't disagree with anything anybody said. I, I think it's been kind of not just this last meeting, but there's just there's been so much consensus when you're meeting like with small groups and then you find out that everybody else is having the same conversations, mm -hmm. which has been really heartening, I think, going through this process. Um, the one thing that I thought um, that people were kind of disappointed about was that we couldn't start on, you know, fresh plot of land. And that was, that was the only thing that I kind of heard from people, but it was kind of still, there was consensus that that's sort of what they wanted. And the only thing I think that needed to be explained a little bit more, and I think going forward when we're looking at this, you know, looking at informing more people is that it's just because you need twice the land that you need to, to build a modern site on because of, you know, lots of different permitting concerns and so um but this that was the same experience that I had I kind of felt like my room was really very strongly pro new building for Waco Waco High School and so it was exciting to hear that everybody else felt the same way our group, our group, did, our group was so excited they started talking they started I was in the group with Dr. King Cannon and they started asking her whether it was big enough because of all the people who are going to come back. <laughs> Jeremy was in that group. <laughs> were you in our group too? <laughs> Jeremy Davis is a special guest here tonight. He was in our group and we're all like, oh, this is so great. All these people are coming back. The school's not big enough. Mm -hmm. and, and, and yeah, really I was actually in a room with two of our Waco High principals. And so I thought we were all real biased because I'm a Waco High alum and there was another Waco High alum there. And we had two principals, so I was really excited to hear everybody else felt the same way because I felt like my group was going to be, you know, obviously really strong for doing this. So, great. It's been going really well, and it is really amazing how um, when we report out, very similar but complementary, and the committee com committee is very diverse. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have high school parents, elementary parents, uh, uh, alum, and just community people. But yet, when we're, the, the, you know, like Alan said, the choice seems so clear and uh, easy. Um, I'm a little head. I don't know that it's going to be that easy going forward, <laughs> but at least, you know. Yes. Well, so that... Um Reminds me, next week's meeting is about uh, middle school campuses. And so that'll be the focus for next week. And then after that, we'll focus on elementary. And it will progressively get harder, I think, because, um, it, you know, more schools involved and, and uh, other factors and decisions to be made. And I don't, I haven't heard any complaints from anybody that we're running over time, but I get real self-conscious about it because we've committed to people. If, um, I don't know who, I was asking uh, Mr. Lucha earlier, who's really responsible for making sure we're on task, and maybe that's our architects, but if we could encourage mm -hmm. people to put their questions in the chat more, mm -hmm. um, especially when we get involved in discussions that um, everybody's, well, I start worrying about the clock, and I'm not even, I don't even know what the agenda is. I just want to be true, true to, to the time. Sure, we can... We can do that at the top in my comments at the beginning. Mm -hmm. 
so when, and remind people. When we, when we open it up for, for the conversation, which is essential and good, people need to know kind of what the time, when we have five minutes allotted here for some questions and answers, and if we, if we start rushing you, it's because we need to keep moving and we want you to put them in the chat. Sure. Let me, one more comment on, kind of on that point. I think the agendas for the four that we've had have been very well constructed. They flow very well. Uh, we're able to move from one item to another item and, and keep the intensity going, so to speak, and the interest level going and the conversation going. So uh, I, I think that uh, that bodes very well as we're kind of in the middle of this process, wrapping it up with other <laughs> very key topics still ahead of us. Great. Thank you for that. We're, uh, we're working behind the scenes to make sure that those are put together well for the, for the community committee. Do you get uh, questions after our meeting? I haven't had any. I've been sending um, the slides out to the committee after the meeting uh, because typically we don't get them from the architects the, until the day of. We've been working them up until that point, but they're finalizing those slides. And so I'm sending those out the day after. And I really haven't had any questions. Um, but I'll tell you, the, the group conversation is really helpful because I, you know, even participating in a small group myself, I'm hearing things to follow up with with the architects. And, and you guys are giving me information along the way, too. So um, that conversation is really good and important to the process. Keep, keep feeding information to us that you're hearing. Well, and I, so this is a, a good segue for Dusty Trailer, who's here tonight, because I know that <laughs> the committee is anxious to, really wants to talk numbers, and we saw some uh, at, on our first, March 1st meeting, but then once I saw those numbers, of course, they want to see more and more and more, but I thought um, this would be a good <clears throat> intro tonight into what our bond capacity is, and just start the conversation. Um, so thank you for coming tonight to help us start thinking. Certainly. Um, again, for the record, Dusty Trailer, Managing Director with RBC Capital Markets. Uh, we have the honor and privilege of serving Waco ISD as financial advisor. Um, I think you've got the electronic copy of our, of our presentation materials up, up top. And, and so I'll, I'll just kind of briefly walk you through um, kind of the contents of our, of our presentation. We've divided the presentation into two primary sections. The first section, I think it's always a good place to start. To, uh, to see kind of what's going on in the state of Texas in terms of uh, recent Texas K-12 bond elections. And so that's section one. And then section two, we get into the discussion of Waco ISD bond capacity uh, and your, just your outstanding debt summary to, to see where we are there. So if you'll look inside section number one, and if you'll turn uh, to page number three of the presentation, what we lay out on that page is just a, an historical look at recent Texas K-12 bond elections. This dates back uh, to the bond elections between from now or since November 2020 back to May 2015. And since that time, Texas school districts have brought forth a total of 694 separate propositions to voters across the state. Uh, requesting uh, authority for approximately $68.42 billion in par amount of bonds. And of that amount, 514 separate propositions have passed uh, and $57.9 billion of par amount have passed since that time. Um, one of the things that we'll point out in, in looking at this, we break out the passage rate of these elections on a number of, uh, of ballot measures basis that you see that from the second to the right column there. And going back to 2015, 74.06% of the propositions have passed. And then if we look on a par amount basis, 84.65% by par amount have, have passed. One of the reasons that you, you see a little bit of a skew there, oh, very good, I can drive the I can drive it now, good, hopefully. Um, one of the reasons that you see a skew there between 
number of proposition, the, the percentage propositions passing versus par amount passing, is there have been a there have been a number of very large bond elections with very large propositions that have passed. Some some bond elections over a billion dollars in par amount that have passed, and that moves that that far right column that percentage up. One of the things that you may note may note is if you look at the November 2020 results. In November 2020, nine billion dollars worth of school district bond bonds were put forth before the voters, and of that amount, seven and a half billion passed. The passage rate, the percentage by the number of propositions, was just under 61 percent. You'll know that's a little bit lower than the historical cycle. Uh, which is historically about 74%. The same is true on the passage by par amount, 83.07 of the November ballots passed uh, versus the, the historical average, about 84.65%. We believe that one of the reasons for that is recent changes to state law that requires a little bit more of further breaking out into separate propositions uh, of different projects. You know, until recently, you could throw all of your projects into one proposition. Now the state is going to re require you to take and start breaking out various projects into their own proposition. And so that gave voters a little bit of pause this past election cycle, and we saw some of those, some of those um, propositions go down. And if you'll turn with me onto page four, you can really see that. We take the November elections the November elections and actually break them down on a district by district basis. And what you'll see there is, I mean, you could look uh, at the very, very top district. Allen ISD, they put forth, see, I shouldn't be driving this. I can't talk and drive at the same time. So um, you'll see Allen ISD at the top of the page. Uh, Allen put forth $222.5 million to its voter and of that, 214 million was successful, but a little over about 7.8 million was unsuccessful. Uh, look at Dallas ISD. Dallas ISD put forth 3.694 billion dollars to its voters. Of that, a little over three and a half billion was successful, but 152.9 was unsuccessful. And so, some of these may have been athletic projects or whatever, but uh, some of the voters would pick off specific projects while passing the vast majority of those put forth to them. So just something we need to consider as we, as we move forward. But overall, and you can tell by this data, overall, Texas voters are very supportive of school district bonds. Very high passage rate by number of propositions, very high passage rate by total dollar amount put to the voters. So it is a good story to tell in terms of the voters seeing the need for facilities improvement here in the state. Hey, Dustin. Yes, sir. Um, not that all uniforms across, all voters across the state are uniform, but what sort of projects aren't making it? Is there a pattern there that you identified just in your analysis? The stuff that's not passing, the line item stuff, right. is they vote that down. I mean, I can imagine athletics is a popular one to poo poo. That 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 seems to be the one that that seems to be the one that seems to get picked off. Um, but uh, candidly, in some districts, that's the one that passes majority. Right? You might see you might see some some school districts they vote down the new high school, but they vote for the new stadium. That can happen, right? So, but but I think primarily um, it's it's the separate athletic propositions that have that have gone down. Indoor practice so. That came out of the, was that the last legislative session where the, you had to separate and um, put more things into propositions? And so we're going to meet with Bond Council next week Good. to talk about pieces of the high school and whether they have to be in separate propositions or right. not. Right, exactly. I think the 2019 legislative cycle is when they, is when they went for that, exactly. So, and we're, see, we're seeing it right now. Uh, I've, got a, I've got a school district right now with a May election. They've got six separate propositions on that, on that ballot. So. so then as we go into the next section, section two, we look at Waco ISD's existing bond summary 
and then the preliminary bond capacity analysis. We, I think it's always important to look at the existing debt profile before we actually look at capacity because uh, the existing debt and the existing bond payments uh, is very much a big key part of our, our capacity for future bonds. And so what we'll, sh what we'll show you here, you guys are very, your, your current structure has you very well prepared for future bond programs. Currently, you all have $151.44 million of outstanding bonds. You can see that that's a dramatic reduction from, if we look at the amount of bonds from the, the five issues that you have outstanding, those bonds had an original par amount of $260.3 million. You guys have paid that down uh, by over $120 million. Uh, going further down, we have taken the, the district's annual debt service and made a graphical depiction of that debt service. And so what you see are the payment amounts that, are, that come due for the existing bonds. And you'll see that those bond payments step down dramatically between now and 2023. And, and you may say, well, well we're, we're talking about having a November bond election or possibly a November bond election. But, but really, if, if you have a November bond election, your first debt service payments on that bond election would come due beginning in the 2023 fiscal year. So you can see that beginning in 2023, your debt service on the existing bonds goes down quite a bit. That creates a fair amount of capacity for you right there. So great timing. And I think it's always important to point out just uh, the, and we've talked about this recently, you guys have been a good steward of the taxpayer's money in terms of seeking opportunities when they're, they're out there to reduce the debt service on your existing bonds. And so here on this page, we show you going back to 2013, the district has completed five separate re refinancings, one most recently here this year. Those refinancings have saved the district and Waco ISD taxpayers approximately $41.1 million over the life of those bonds. And then also in 2020, you guys defeased, which is a fancy word for saying you early paid about $650,000 of annual, uh, $650,000 of bond principal at that point. That also created savings of about $460,000. So you guys are continuously looking at opportunities to, to save money for the district, for the district's taxpayers, and that's really shown here. And that, again, also goes a long way towards helping to create capacity for future programs. As we get into further into the summary, uh, we, you know, we look at bond capacity. The other driver of bond capacity is the district's tax base and tax rates. So on this page, what we do is we show the district's TAV. That's taxable assessed valuation. That's your tax base. Going back to the 2012 fiscal year, uh, in 2012, the district's tax base was $3.9 billion. In the current year that we are in right now, uh, the district's tax base is approximately $6.9 billion. Uh, if you, we were to look at that growth rate, the district has grown at a rate of between, if you want to look at it on a five-year basis, 6.5% per year. If you want to look at it on a 10-year basis, about 5.8% per year is the annual average growth rate of the district's tax base. Additionally, since that time, we look at the tax rate. Uh, the district's tax rate most recently hit a high in 2018 of $1.41 per $100 in valuation. Currently, that tax rate is $1.26.4, 1.264. Uh, so you guys have brought that tax rate down by a little over 13 cents during that time frame. Now, a great majority of that was due to the school finance changes and compression in the M&O tax rate, uh, but you, you have also brought down uh, your INS tax rate a little bit during that time as well. Now, the, the tax base numbers that we talked about on that page include values that are frozen, okay? In our analysis, when we run an analysis 
to look at bond capacity, we've got to allocate the tax levy on those frozens a different way because we can't increase the amount of levy on the frozens. So you'll see on this page, your actual net of frozens tax base here in the district is $6.47 billion. And that's what we use to start our capacity analysis with. So our assumptions are your current INS tax rate, which is interest and sinking fund, that's the portion of the tax rate used to pay, solely used to pay debt service on bonds. Um, and then the $6.47 billion tax base, we assume that that tax base actually remains the same for this upcoming year. Just given uh, all of the, the fallout from the pandemic, I think the chief appraiser has a little bit of concern over growth. So for next year, we're assuming that that tax base, to be conservative, does not grow. But then in the following years, for a period of three years, we're assuming that the tax base grows at a rate of 3% per year. Which again, if you go back and, and refer back to the page prior, that's cons pretty conservative based upon where you guys have been over the preceding 10 cycles. So there's some level of conservatism there. We also assume that you do collect about $900,000 per year into your INS fund from frozen levies. We allocate that, and that's a, that's a fixed amount per year. We don't assume that that grows over the life, and likely it probably would. We also assume that you collect your taxes at about a 98% clip every year. So we talked a lot about interest rates the last time I was here. Um, for this analysis, we did not assume current market interest rates because, again, we're talking about a potential November election. Rates could go up between now and then. So we assume that, that interest rates for the bonds from year one out to year 30 would be a full 1.15% higher than they are now, okay? Just to build in a level of conservatism into those rates. So the scenarios that we ran are, at the, are outlined here at the bottom of page nine. We ran a total of six scenarios. Um, the first scenario we did is we said, hey, based upon all the factors we know right now, how, what's Waco ISD's bond capacity without increasing the INS tax rate at all? And that's, that's $145.45 million, okay? And then from there, we ran additional analyses from $150 million to $350 million. And so I'll show you on the next page graphically what those impacts are. The $150 million scenario increases the INS tax rate by just one-third of one cent, okay? $200 million is 3.46 cents. $250 million is 6.46 cents. $300 million is 9.51 cents or below 10 cents. A lot, you know. And then uh, scenario six, 350 million is 13 and a quarter cents, the increase on the INS tax rate there. And so taking it one step further, we then took, we took that, those tax rate increases and said, okay, how does this affect a homeowner here in Waco ISD? The average, Cheryl provided us with this, da this data, the average homeowner here in Waco ISD has a taxable assessed valuation or a taxable value of $117,499. So the graphs down below on the bottom left, we're showing the annual impact to that homeowner. Graphs on the right show the monthly impact to that home homeowner. So you'll see like for instance, scenario three, the $200 million scenario, on an annual basis, that would cost a homeowner $40.65, or six dollars, or three dollars and thirty-nine cents per month. Okay. And I won't run you, run you through all of these, but the three hundred just the three hundred million is one hundred eleven dollars and seventy-four cents per year, and on a monthly basis, that's nine dollars and thirty-one cents per month, or less than ten dollars per month for three hundred million. And then 350 is $155.69 per year or $12.97 per month. Okay. And we I, I think that it is appropriate always to show the monthly, just simply because as a 
uh, as a rate payer, you know, I work on my budget on a monthly. Most people look at their m budgets on a monthly basis. So I think it's appropriate to really boil this down to how most people look at their budgets. And then the pages that follow, they get into the nitty gritty detail of the spreadsheets, okay? So page number 12 is the spreadsheet that drives our capacity analysis for the no tax rate increased um, assumption. You can see the column two has the, the full blown tax base at the 6.4 billion and then growing a bit. Column three are existing. And then columns four and five are the actual estimated debt service structures on the new bonds. We assumed that with your bond program that whichever bond program you, you, you size bond program you chose, that you would probably issue about two thirds of that voted authority in year one and come back in year two and issue the, the, the remaining voted authority. We can take and model this out any way, any way that you guys would like us to. But in terms of, you know, we, we want to look at this in terms of how you guys would likely be conducting your construction program, right? You're going you're gonna to have to design these uh, projects. You're going to have to let contracts and things like that. And so it probably does not make sense to go out and issue all of the bonds at one time before you're ready to get, get projects actually up and off the ground. Because once you issue those bonds, while we're in a very low interest rate environment now and expect to remain in a nice interest rate environment, once you go issue the bonds, the interest clock starts on whatever amount you issue. So we assumed breaking it up into two, two sales. And we could look at breaking it up further or, or however you like. So you can see going all the way over to column 11, well, column 10 shows the estimated INS tax rate for each year of the bond program, and then column 11 just shows you that m maximum INS tax rate increase. This particular scenario on page 12 is the 145.45 million, which is the no tax rate increase. And so you can walk, we could walk through page by page, and you could see how the model, what we do with these spreadsheets. I always like to tell my clients, if you get home tonight and you're having a hard time going to sleep, let me pull this out and study it. <laughs> these pages anyway, these pages anyway. But I, you know, I, I really, um, I enjoy what I do and I get jazzed up about what I do. And it excites me to see Waco ISD in the position that you're in um, and, and contemplating future projects. I think you're set up nicely from the bond standpoint to do that. Any, any questions that you guys have for me or any, any comments that you may have in terms of, hey, we'd like, we'd like for you to consider running this scenario or running this solution. Dusty, uh, your presentation is very, very clear. Uh, a lot of really good information here for us to look at. Uh, regarding your summary of assumptions, would you say that your assumptions tend to be on the conservative side, a little aggressive, in the middle. Where I, I think they're, that they're conservative. You know, uh, our tax base growth. We're assuming no growth in the tax base for right now, and then three percent per year for the for, for only three years after that, and then holding it uh, constant. Uh, I think that's very very conservative. And then the the interest rate. Assumptions, I think, is 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 some level of conservatism, um, and you know, if I were to be too conservative there, we try to strike that balance, right? We want to be conservative, and I think we've done that there. But if we go too conservative, then I think we we project a tax rate impact that is actually much higher than what you really realize. So we're we're constantly trying to strike a, an appropriate balance there. I think we've done that. Tell us again how you're planning to hold interest rates down. And <laughs> again, again, we, we assumed interest rates would be at least a full percentage point higher than they are today. And uh, so, yes, uh, we things are kind of mixed up. But, it, you know, and that, uh, again, I, I think, you know, it, it goes back to the conversation we had a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the timing that you all had and getting everything ready to do the refinancing. Um, 
I'm delighted that we did it when we did it, as opposed, you know, as opposed to being here and, and presenting it tonight. So. It's good to have it in the bank. We just need to keep it in the bank. That's right. That's right. Thank you. Yes, sir. So if we communicate, um, let's say we chose scenario four, and we communicated that that would be 6% using conservative assumptions, and our tax values trended for the last average that you had showed us, which I forgot what it was, uh, 8 or 9 percent, wasn't it? Five? Between, uh, be between six and a half, yeah, between six yeah, and six and a half percent. Trend, yeah, so we come in higher on those tax values, then we're not going to be raising taxes. That's right. Prices. If you trend higher than that, we should be able to hold the, ta the total tax rate even lower than that, that 6.46 cents. That's so correct. So I, I think the question about conservative, you know, these are conservative assumptions. Right. Good question. All right. Well, thank you all very much. And again, as, as you, we are, um, we like to be a, a part of the process and an extension of your team. And as you, as you walk through this, happy to come back and, and, and update anything we need to update or, or um, citizens committees, whatever you need. We're, we're, we're happy to help. Thank you all. Have a great night. Okay, so this is our first sort of a budget update and get getting into our budget development cycle. Normally, I would do this presentation in February because we kind of talk about how we ended up last year, where we were at, and start getting into some of the projections for this year. Um, this is, but of course, nothing's been usual in this past year, so running a little bit late here. Um, this kind of just shows us our general fund summary for the 2019-20 school year and where we ended up, what our variances are. Um, our audited actuals, we ended up with $157.4 in revenue, expenditures of $153.4 million, and other sources, which was a sale of some of our surplus property of $42,000, and then our other uses of $655,000. Now, that other uses is where we transfer um, operating expenditures. Um, costs from Guala, Guaca, and our regional day school for the deaf, where they have deficits, we have to do an operating transfer over to those funds. So that gave us a net change in our fund about positive fund, about positive change of $3.4 million. Our beginning fund balance was 49.2. Our ending fund balance is 52.7 million. Now that's a total fund balance. We'll look at it as it's broken out by um, the, we have restricted, we have unspendable committed fund balances, and then we have our unassigned fund balance, which was 46 million. I've shown the variances over in the last two columns, the variance from the original budget and the variance from the um, revised budget. Now these are significantly different from what we normally see. We normally underspend the budget somewhere around $4 million. But as you can see this year, uh, we underspent by $10 million from the original budget and we underspent the amended budget by $14.8 million. However, revenues were also down significantly mm -hmm. in those categories. Our original budget, our revenues were down $7 million from what we originally budgeted and then down about 2.7 million from the amended budget. The reason that was closer is because we actually amended the budget in August to take those foundation school program revenues out that were replaced by the federal funds. So that came out closer in that category. Um, this is kind of our 10 year trend of our revenues and expenditures. As you can see, our revenues last year did trend up. That's a result of House Bill 3 and getting all that additional revenue from the state. 
Uh, we did have uh, significant increases in our state revenue. Our local revenue did not do quite as well as what we had originally anticipated. We talked about that through the year, that we did not have the adjustments last year that we had been having for the previous two years. Um, three years ago, we had about $3 million upward adjustments. Um, the year before, it was about two, and then last year, it was about one. So that had some um, impact on our local revenue. The expenditures did not cr increase at the same rate. Now, budgetarily, we expected them to increase a little bit more, but because of school closures at the end of the year, there was a lot of under expenditures. Um, you'd see that in our sub costs, in our tutoring costs, to name a few, and some, not as much as maybe supplies and materials, student travel. Uh, we, a lot of the projects that we had budgeted, we were not able to complete last year. And while we put in purchase orders and amended money in to buy technology, it didn't come in by August 31st, a lot of it. We had, I know, $900,000 worth of technology came in on September 4th. So it's going to hit in this year's budget. So we had a lot of under expenditures in those kinds of categories. This kind of shows you what our general fund unassigned fund balance is. And this is um, at the end of last year, we ended up with a 27.9% um, and this is a percent of the expenditure budget. And right now with the budget that we have adopted, that's, and like I said, that's just the adopted budget, it's about 26.2%. One of the things, one of the largest um, under expenditures, and, and I'll talk about that in a minute, was that shift in the school calendar where we actually started school much later in August. So about 10 days of instruction or 10 days of teacher work days were pushed from last year into this year. And so that is a major component of the under expenditures in last year. And that's partially why we have a deficit budget in the current year and we show that fund balance going down is because we're picking up those extra 10 days. So this is the breakdown of our fund balances in the general fund. As I said, we have non-spendable fund balances. Those are monies that are actually tied up. They're already spent, but they haven't been expended. Inventories of 588,000 um, prepaid items. Now, this 591,000 that you see there is actually our bulk purchase. We, were, we participated in some federal stimulus funds where we got a match from the state on a bulk purchase of, of technology. So we had, and we had to send a check to Region 4 for them to buy the technology, so, but we didn't actually have the computers at that point. So they're shown as a prepaid expenditure in last year's budget. On, then we have our restricted fund balance. This is restricted under contract. This is the fund balance remaining in the transformation zone of where they have earned state revenues and have not yet spent them. And that's $2.1 million. Committed funds, again, like I said, we had quite a bit of project money that we had intended to spend in last year that did not end up getting spent. So there was a million dollars in some maintenance projects that we were doing. 1.1 million dollars in buses that had, did not get delivered by the end of the year, and then um, open POs of 1.1 million. So again, that gives us about a 46 million dollar unassigned fund balance that we can use for anything. Now, since we reduced, I, I showed down below the line here, our unspent ESSER funds because. We reduced our foundation school program revenues in the general fund, and they were made up with these ESSER funds. I decided to include that number there of what we did not spend of the ESSER funds. So that is sort of an additional fund balance for us in this past year, and that was $2.2 million. We, um, so we had basically for general operations, because those funds were not subject to supplant rules, we could spend them on pretty much everything. There were some restrictions as far as you no know, technology and, and um, 
remote learning and some of those things that they were aimed at, but we can, they're pretty liberal in what we can spend them on. So we had about 54.8 million that we could use for general operations. Now, as of right now, all those ESSER funds are obligated. We have spent all of ESSER 1. We got ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 coming, but we've spent all of ESSER 1. We just did that, you know, um, we, uh, Kyle had presented last year the uh, plan that we had to, for student devices and the cohorts that we had for a four-year cohort. We actually, with the money we had last summer, we did cohorts one and two instead of doing cohort two in this year. And we just obligated the funds, the rest of the ESSER funds for cohort three. So we are well on our way for our um, device, our student device plan. So I normally tell you what the major variances were for the, in the budget from what we did. Um, so I started doing this, and I gave up on it at one point, then kind of went back to working on it again. Revenues were not hard, but expenditures were all over the place. So as I said, property tax collections from our original budget, those were down about a million seven because we did not have the adjustments that we typically do. On our investment earnings, I had planned for some loss because of the interest rates and investment earnings. Those ended up a little bit higher than we expected. The foundation school program revenue, again, this most of this from the original budget is the 4.7 million that we lost in foundation school program revenue that is accounted for in a special revenue fund as ESSER funds. But we also were down in some other categories for the foundation school program. Part of that was just um, with the House Bill 3, some of the factors like in the uh, career college military readiness, they were, we were supposed to get some funding on our military identified students and that we ended up not able to generate those funds. That was about 100,000. So there was uh, some things just with that new law that um, our comp ed counts had originally been quite a bit higher than they ended up. So we lost a little bit of money there. But anyway, we're down 6.5 million from the original budget and 4.7 from the, our amended budget. Our TRS on behalf revenue was um, down from what we, or up actually from what we thought it was going to be. And our indirect cost revenue was also up um, from what we had originally budgeted. Part of that is because those ESSER funds were subject to indirect cost. And so we were able to actually collect indirect cost back off the ESSER funds to help with our general fund budget. So this looks at our property taxes. As I said, um, it shows you those adjustments at the very bottom of those bars on the last three bars. You see how large those adjustments were three years ago, two years ago, and then last year, a much smaller amount. And here, this shows our property tax collections and adjustments. You can see three years ago, we collected from the original levy, we collected 104.9% of that original levy because those adjustments were so high. Then two years ago, we collected almost 103% of the original levy, and then last year, it was down to 1015 So that was part of why we had overestimated our local tax revenue in building last year's budget. And then you see at the bottom chart is the what the tax collections are as a percent of that local, of that current levy. So this is the one I really gave up on. Major variances and expenditures to budget. Um, it was just all over the place. Uh, again, I mean, substitute costs about half a million dollars that we underspent. We normally spent over $2 million in substitute costs. So we saved about half a million dollars there. Part-time personnel and tutoring. Um, from the original budget, about 650000 Salaries and wages, and this is all, most of this is where that 10 days shifted between the years. Now, it's about half a million overall for the district, but that includes all of our Title I funds and everything. So for the general fund, the impact of that was, from the original budget, was $4 million that we saved in salary savings. And again, that pushed in, uh, most of that pushed into the current year. 
um, facilities projects because we w did actually commit funds for Paul Tyson and some of the other projects last year. So we underspent that by 2.8 million. Those funds have rolled forward into the current year to be spent in this year. We actually um, overspent contracted services from the original budget and the revised budget it was under because those are some pro also some projects that we moved in during the year. Utilities, we underspent a million dollars from the original budget because the schools were closed. And so we had very little expenditures from March through August in our utility budgets. Fuel, again, weren't running buses. Um, we did continue to pay and, and our Gold Star, our transportation contractor, to keep bus drivers uh, working, but we still saved in fuel in some of those um, categories. Technology devices, on the other hand, we did spend more than we originally budgeted because we did amend money in. It would have been higher than this, but after the end of the school year, as we started getting our ESSER money and started getting some other funding sources, we moved expenditures out of the general fund to those federal funding sources. And so that's where you kind of see a reflection here of that, that with the um, amended budget, a, there's a difference of 1.6 million. Supplies and materials, we spent a lot of money on personal protective <laughs> supplies and equipment, but did not spend quite as much in some of our other areas. Field trips and student travel, big hit because most of those occur late in the school year in May and April. So we saved $110,000 there from the original budget. Employee travel, nobody was traveling in spring and summer, $443,000. And then again, our bus purchases, $608,000 that um, we actually had encumbered from the original budget that rolled forward because they weren't delivered until the fall. How many buses was that? Seven. Seven. And they, they all the, um, got the uh, seat belts in them this time around also, right? Yes. We do order our buses with seat belts. So then the other thing that we do measure every year that will come out in, as part of our um, financial accountability is our administrative cost ratio. Um, for this past year, for 1920, it's estimated that that's going to be right at 9.8%. And then based on our budget for this next year, it's about 9.6%. Um, our cap, I didn't put that other, our cap is right at 11% for a district our size. Getting into the current year and now looking at our enrollment and uh, attendance. So, last year when we were developing the budget, we were not quite sure how we were going to measure some of these things. So, what I have here is um, an enrollment and average daily attendance for the last uh, 10 years. And it kind of shows you where we've been. We've been very flat, as you can see, um, from 15,000. 10 years ago to about 14.8 this past year. Now I've got two, a couple of different numbers I'm gonna show here that we normally wouldn't have. Our average daily attendance as we ended last year, and I'll show you that calculation in a minute, was 13,354. When you look at the summary of finances that generates our funding, you're going to see an attendance of 12,693 because T, the way TEA adjusted our foundation school program revenue downward for the ESSER funds was they adjusted our ADA down. So, because they had no other mechanism to do it. So they went in and adjusted all of our um, ADA based calculations downward which is going to be very difficult for us when we're looking at future years and trying to do patterns because we've got this um, summary of finances that really is not factual in the way it's, look, it's calculated. So the adjustment was to reduce the FSP revenue by 4.7 million. We did end up getting 
5.1 million in the ESSER 1 funds. Because originally the 4.7 was what we were going to get. That's how they adjusted our ADA. But we ended up getting 5.1 when all was said and done. So we did actually pick up about 400,000 of new money out of that ESSER 1 funding. But we spent more on PPE. Correct. And some other things. Uh, more technology because absolutely we did but not only did we get that we also generated the 600,000 from the CRF block purchase program which helped with some of that technology we collected about 300,000 in CRF from the Texas Department of Emergency Management we got about 300 that helped us with our um, PPE and some of those things and then we have applied, we haven't received it yet, but they also had a prior period reimbursement grant through the CRF money. We applied for that. That 900000 that I said that came in on September 4th, we applied for those funds, and they will fund about 75% of that. They didn't fund everything because there were some pieces of it that they, that's not part of what they would fund but we should get somewhere around 700000 of that 900000 back for that. And that will come into the current year. So a lot of our technology actually did get funded through the federal funds. And then the ESSER II, as I said, we've you know, spent a lot of uh, that money for technology as well. Down at the bottom, you see that um, we had originally projected for 2020-2021 enrollment of, well, this is actually, this is an actual number. This is our fall team's actual was 14,398. That's a decrease of almost 400, about 380 students from fall teams of last year. Our, the, the legislative planning estimate from TEA was 13,215. This is an ADA number. They currently have us at 12,309. I'm not quite sure what that is, why they have decreased it so much at this point. Um, there's not a real explanation for it. Uh, I think they were thinking that's what it's going to be without a hold harmless, and that's why it's as low as it is. Now, the TEA's hold harmless ADA that they calculated based on two years ago and what our pattern had been. And as we talked during budget development, it was a great moment for them to pick, I guess, to calculate what our hold harmless ADA was going to be because it was in a year we had been increasing for a couple of years. So we actually got a higher ADA than I think we would have had even if COVID never happened. Um, so that was 13,538 and then because our ADA projection based on our actual ADA from the third six weeks was only 12,913. So as you can see, we're picking up over 600 students in ADA using the hold harmless from what it looks like it would have been based on the third six weeks. So this is how we calculated it for budget for last year and for this year. We did pretty good last year. Um, we, had to be, we had four six weeks that we had good numbers for, and then we had to use the patterns from prior years to calculate the um, total for the whole year. So our, you see what our 18, 19 numbers were there, what the fifth and sixth weeks were, and then the ratio of that four six weeks to the total six six weeks and that we applied then to our first four six weeks for last year. I had then assumed it would be about 13,357.7. It was TEA used 13,353.7, so we were only four kids off from what TEA calculated. For the current year, we, when we were developing the budget, we knew we would have hold harmless for the first two six weeks. So we used that hold harmless and then calculated some numbers, which would have been way too high. So it's a good thing we're getting more hold harmless um, for the rest of the year. Uh, so I had used 13,241 for budget development purposes and calculating revenues in the current year. 
Now, this is what the hold harmless is currently sitting at. Based on right, right before we left for spring break, the commissioner came out and had extended the hold harmless through the rest of the school year. Um, they added in a hold harmless for the compensatory education because originally hold harmless was only going to be on ADA based counts and compensatory education is not ADA based, it's a student count. And so they have extended the hold harmless since last year was the first year they did comp ed on this basis, it would be just last year's numbers going forward. Now, I still need to look to make sure because some of these were all or nothing. And if comp ed is all or nothing with the rest of us, we'll actually lose money in comp ed because our comp ed counts were higher this year than they were last year. So we really, I want to be able to use this year's comp ed and last year or the hold harmless for the other. Now, you see here for the grades pre-K through 12, the ADA hold harmless was automatic for the first two six weeks. You had to apply for the third six weeks, which we did, because we did qualify. We were eligible under their criteria for the third six weeks. And then for the fourth, fifth, and sixth weeks, you will qualify if in the last six weeks of school, at least 80% of your um, Students are participating in person and or at least as high as the percentage reported from enrolled students coded on campus during the fall PINs. Our number was 63, somewhere around 63 percent. What was it? Something like that. Anyway. So we are above that right now. We're about 72 percent right now. So we feel like we will be able to make that in the six six weeks but we need to make sure that we have kids in school and are still participating in order to get that hold harmless through the six six weeks we won't meet that we right now we're not meeting the 80 percent threshold so we have to use the second bullet there and keep that a count up during that last six weeks and then if we hadn't met that third six weeks the last one doesn't really apply to us because if we hadn't been eligible to meet to get the waiver for the third six weeks, which we were, then we could have used this last criteria to make us eligible um, for the, the second semester. But that's not necessary for us to do that. So, oh, here's the numbers. I had them on the next slide. Um, so, our, so the for Paul Peen submission, we were at 65.3%. So our calculation based on the current enrollment, which was uh, about a week ago, was 72.2%. So as I said, we are exceeding it at this point. Um, if we had had to meet that uh, criteria for, if we hadn't been eligible in the third six weeks, we would have had to a target of 77.6% for the last six weeks. So this is what it looks like right now. If we, First call or the second column is what we use for budget, the 213,241 for ADA. Without any hold harmless, we would probably be about 12,912 and would be losing about $2 million just on basic allotment alone. For the first, using the first two six weeks, we would have been at about 13,000 and would lose about a million two. Using the first semester, which was our rules up until about a week ago, we would have lost about 532,000. Now, these numbers don't include some of the impact on our special populations because um, when we look at this, special ed actually has been increasing each year and is going to be held harmless at the uh, ADA from two years ago. So we actually lose money, lose funding in special ed because it, then with the change that they, um, put out on the on March 4th, we would be at 13 that 13,537 all year, and we would pick up a million eight. I just before I came down, I ran it through the template with the special ed counts out and everything, and it looks like we would pick up about a million three net. So we're going to gain from COVID. <laughs> so so.
this was, this, like I said, this was a good time for them to have done that ADA calculation for us because in another year we were probably trending downward because we kind of go up and down a little bit. And uh, it was just a good year for them to pick because we were going up that year. But anyway, so this is kind of what it looks like for right now. We are still understanding the budget by quite a bit. Again, you know, in the area of substitute costs, um, when I presented to the zone uh, board, a couple weeks ago, they said, well, but we, uh, we just need subs all the time. We're needing subs. And so how could we be underspending subs? I said, because we don't have subs. I mean, we're needing them because we don't have them, but we're not spending money on them. So um, it looked like we're down several hundred thousand there in the subs. And that's in the financial statements next week. I've kind of got some analysis of that. So that's where we are at this point in time um, for start working on projecting next year's ADA and what those revenues are going to look like. And of course, this is a legislative session. I don't think we're expecting a whole lot of changes, really, for House Bill 3. They've kind of um, said they're going to fully fund it at this point anyway. And there's a lot of federal money coming into the system that I think they have no excuse to not fully fund it. And so I'm, I think our biggest question is going to be our ADA. For next year and what that's going to look like. Yeah. I don't have a question, sure. I just want to say, express my thanks to you for uh, your leadership, your oversight, and your diligence on uh, getting us through this extremely turbulent time with regards to the district finances. I mean, we all know this year has been extraordinary at the campus level, downtown, the financial side. All employees have been extremely responsive. And I want to congratulate you and thank you for the work that you've done, as evidenced by this information that you presented. I mean, the landscape's changing. It's changing fast. I have every confidence that was, as we emerge from this, uh, our finances with your leadership are going to be uh, uh, strong and growing stronger. Uh, you kept the ship afloat along with you know, downtown staff and uh, your staff. And I uh, just want to say uh, appreciate all the work that you've done because you've had to deal with a lot of uh, landscape changes from TEA and other uh, aspects. But uh, we all know also in the finance area, numbers can change rapidly. And you've got to be responsive to that. And I think you've been very, very responsive to that and providing us input. So I thank you very much. I would like to recognize Robin Wilson, who is our state and federal programs director, sure. because without her this year, I know we would not be in the position we are in getting federal funds because I could call Robin up and say, there's a, there's a webinar on FEMA. I, I can't be at it. I need you to sit through this webinar to see how we can get these FEMA funds. And she has just the... Uh, CRF money that came through the Texas Department of Energy Management was a nightmare. Let me tell you, we went through we iteration after iteration after iteration of applying for those funds. And they'd send it back, and we'd have to clean something else up. And she just kept at it and kept those things going. And, um, you know, I could not have gotten all these funding sources and funded some of what we did without her help. So she really was great. Turbulent was a good word. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good evening, Madam President and members of the board. It's my honor to talk to you about phase two of the teacher incentive allotment tonight. Always like to open up with some points of pride. This year is our first implementation year and our what we call our data collection year. And in spite of all the challenges, we have been able to implement all three measures of our designation. You know, I have heard that other districts have had to make some adjustments, but we have uh, moved forward with that. We have had to make some pivots, but just minor pivots, of course, uh, with um, online learning and 
you know, our assessments and, and those types of things. Uh, that has posed a challenge, but our staff has been wonderful and made those pivots uh, that were necessary. We also, like mid-year, uh, our technology department in coordination with CNI did a wonderful job uh, setting up our online teacher uh, dashboard and tracker. So that can inform a number of things from professional development to uh, just, it, it really gives us an insight on the coaching that's happening for our teachers. And then the other point to pride is just bringing the TIA and opportunity culture together. We really believe it's a game changer for our teachers as far as retention and recruitment uh, is concerned. And it's not going to be an instant game changer, but we think over time, we think it will really pick up momentum. And as we're planning closely with CNI, we, we see those, those alignments. And um, so I do anticipate they will continue to work beautifully together. I've shared why we do this work, but I always like to talk about the why. You know, one is always about the impact we have on students, you know, increasing student growth and achievement, closing our opportunity gaps, and supporting teacher growth. So this is about having impact on students, but of course, in order to have impact on students, we have to have impact on teachers. We, our retention rates are still at the forefront and very important to the work that we do, and we believe this can help us retain our teachers. And of course, it increases the equity of access to the most effective teachers because the the allotments are based on the high, the higher allotments are aligned to the higher need schools. And then, of course, we can remain competitive in a tight labor market. And I can tell you that one of the hot topics for this year is teacher retention and, and recruitment. So it's, it's getting tougher. So we want to stay at the head of the game here, or get to the head of the game. Our stakeholder engagement is also very important, and I always share this slide with you, but just want to share a few items. You know, we have every department on our TI core committee. We have teachers on our committee, principals on our committee. Uh, we have a subcommittee. Uh, we have a teacher buy-in survey committee responds to our surveys. And then we have a teacher expert group that meets uh, frequently throughout the year. And then we also gather additional input. You know, we, we take this to the QDAC. We share this with our, we keep our teacher associations updated. And uh, we have a partnership and or thought partnership with Texas Education Agency and our best in class, which is a number of school districts who come together and talk about this work and share ideas. So I think all of these together has have really helped us implement and, and also plan for phase two. So our timeline, it's fast and furious and it's constantly moving, but this spring, you know, we're continuing to, continuing to have our meetings with our core team and our expert teachers. CNI continues to have provide PD. We just launched a teacher buy-in survey. We're, we'll be doing this every year. We think that's important to, to get teacher input uh, on, on their knowledge about this work and, and their buy-in levels. We also, in a few weeks, have, uh, will be submitting phase two, because as you recall, we have three phases in the implementation, so we'll need to get phase two approved. And then we're in the data collection, um, and we'll be wrapping up our data collection at the end of the year. But this summer, we'll be compiling some teacher scorecards and sharing that with our teachers, analyzing the data to determine which teachers will move forward for designation. And then we will uh, be launching the communication for phase two once it's approved. In the fall, we, uh, we will have to send our data to Texas Tech for this school year. And then we will have data that will give us information about different, how to differentiate our PD to best, better support our teachers. And we'll be in the implementation phase of phase two. And of course, we're always improving. And then in spring of next school year, uh, we will, um, TEA will notify us of the designations. The state funding will begin to flow for, for these allocations, and we will have payouts uh, by that summer. And then we'll be in phase three. We'll be planning phase, phase three and, and hoping to submit that for approval. And that will complete our three phase ends. But that's really the timeline for the next several semesters. So what are we proposing in phase two? So I want to thank the 
the committee for, for meeting regularly and, and really dialoguing about this work. It, it, it literally take, took us all year because there's so much to discuss about where to land on this because we know it impacts students, it impacts teachers, and, uh, and those decisions just can't be made um, in isolation. So in phase two, we're adding the science and social studies teachers. So we already have all schools involved with reading and math, and now we'll have all schools uh, involved in this work uh, and include the science and social studies. Our measurements and weights aren't going to change. We want to keep that the same. So it's 40% teacher performance, which is the t-test as the measure, and student growth is 50%. We are going to continue to use pre and post tests. This year we used Texas Kia, Circle for Pre-K, Texas Kia for Kinder, and Renaissance for first through 12th. But we are going to continue the pre and post test, and that's the piece that had to change for science and social studies, and that's what I'll share with you in the next uh, upcoming slide. And then we're going to continue to, to base 10% of the weight on core leadership practices. And again, I've shared all of these with you in a previous presentation. But here's what we're proposing for the measures for student growth measures in science. So, in, so one of the things that's really important to the committee is that we're not assessing kids just for the sake of assessing or to measure you know, uh, growth and, and performance of, of a teacher. We, we believe that it has to be, be meaningful and purposeful. And in, at elementary, we already give the fifth grade star in science, so we believe that, that that's the right assessment to do. So we'll, the pretest will be the release star and the post-test is the spring star. There will be no social studies testing in addition to what teachers already do at the elementary level because every teacher is already covered with, with reading, math, and with this addition of science. We did calculate a few teachers who may only teach science or science and social studies at fourth grade, but we're working through those few with, with the principals so that every teacher can be eligible for TIA at the elementary level with the addition of only the science star. In middle school for science, 6th uh, and 7th grade, we're going to uh, create um, an in-house assessment around release star questions that are aligned to those grade levels because the 8th grade star does have assessment questions on 6th grade and the 7th grade level, well, from the 6th and 7th grade TEKS. And uh, so we'll have that. We'll have a pretest and a post-test with, with the release questions. And in 8th grade, we're going to use the release a release star for the pretest and the actual spring star for the post test. At high school, we're going to use exams that are already being used. We're going to use AP exams. So we really hope that using these AP exams will really put a focus on the on the um, AP assessments. And we'll have those in chemistry and environmental science. And then the EOCs, we have uh, that assessment in biology. Physics and chemistry, uh, we'll be using the, a textbook, the textbook assessment that is provided that is aligned to the TEKS, and it's the HMH Physics Texas Assessment and then the HMH Chemistry Texas Assessment. So those are our science measures. In social studies, like I mentioned, elementary will not have any additional measure, uh, assessments outside of what a teacher typically does for social studies. But in middle school, we're going to use, again, the textbook, the SAVAS, end of course. And there's a, there are two tests, two SAVAS tests. And we'll use one at, at the beginning of the year and one at the end of the year. And in eighth grade, we have the, we'll have a release star, eighth grade social studies. And then we'll use the spring star, eighth grade social studies for the post-test. And at high school, we'll use AP exams for social studies for world history and geography, and then for end of course exams, we have the U.S. history test that we can use. So that should cover our, um, our, our growth measures and really align well with the assessments that are already in play. Uh, funding source, or I'm sorry, funding distribution, our funding source is TEA. Uh, the funding distribution, 75% uh, is still going to be designated for teacher allotment in phase two. By phase three, when all the teachers are included, we hope to increase that number. 
But for now, because all teachers aren't included until phase three, um, we're going to still allot 15% to other high-performing teachers, and then 10% will remain for uh, to fund some of the pieces that make TIA happen here in Waco ISD. Uh, the last time I pre so those numbers stayed the same also from the last time, but what has changed is instead of a one-time stipend, we're going to do a one-time supplemental pay, so it'll be a separate check in August. It uh, benefits teachers uh, because they there's less uh, deductions if we pay them that way. So we do want this to benefit teachers as much as possible. And um, as I mentioned, the funding will change um, over time once we have a full phase in. TRS eligibility. This is also very important to keep us competitive. So we learned that districts can uh, make take the deductions from the 90%. So in, in our case, it'd be the 75% of that allocation and then 15% for the other high-performing teachers. So to make this TRS eligible and sustainable, the committee is recommending that we, um, that we make that deduction with, with that payout. So, so we are going to make them TRS eligible, but it'll be part of that 75% payout or that 15% payout. And uh, we know that we're going to have to communicate this with teachers because they'll see their allocation and they'll just have, you know, we'll just have to uh, make sure we're very clear about what this might look like because although it's your allocation, you still, you'll still have that TRS uh, deduction from that payout. And, and again, we just think that most districts that uh, I interact with, they are making it TRS eligible. So it, it is, I think, in our best interest to make us competitive to do that. And it benefits teachers long term. All right, moving forward. So we'll be submitting the, the new TIA application for phase two in a few weeks. Then uh, we're going to be coming back to you with some policies because it's going to impact policy when teachers move around and move out of our district. So we'll need to bring that to you for approval. And we'll be reviewing our teacher buy-in survey results. Those will be ready in June. And um, we're going to be collecting that data so that we can determine which teachers will be designated. And, um, and then we are going to submit our data to Texas Tech. And we're really excited about this. We know that this is going to take us a few years to, to have some really good momentum. Districts who already did this for the first time, I mean, they don't have large numbers of teachers that are designated yet. But as soon as they get their congruence tightened up, and I, I can see this taking two or three years to really get all those things tightened up. And, and this year, I think we could have moved a little faster, but, you know, it's been really challenging. And I'm just grateful that I have a wonderful collaboration with every department. Uh, they attend every meeting. Uh, you know, our chief of staff is there. I mean, every head of the department, I mean, they are so committed to this work. Our principals who are on that committee attend. If they have to miss, they, I mean, they'll go to three quarters of the meeting and get out to go to another meeting if they have to, but they really, I've been really um, just fortunate, I think, to work with such a great committee for this TIA, but we hope to get this uh, next round approved in um, full approval like we did the first time. So that's the end of my presentation. Are there any questions? So are you saying that it's going to be uh, two or three years before uh, anyone see any uh, payback out of this? No, sir. Um, I don't know how many teachers will, will submit for designation, but I see that throughout the years we'll be submitting more and more teachers as uh, this picks up momentum because there's lots of moving pieces to this work. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just, I just know that our numbers will go up throughout, throughout the years of teachers who will be receiving money. And, and, and what uh, you're saying, what, uh, this is going to be paid by TA. We won't be funding this. It's right? an allotment that is, yes, it's money that is sent to us. Yeah, part of House Bill 3. And the first payout would be August of 22. Yes, because this, um, yep. Yeah. But after that, it'll be every year. We'll have also momentum on that, too. It's just the first payout takes a little while. What did you say? I said it will be here before you know it. It will. Everything's here before you know it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Very tedious work.
Thank you. Just much like Carol's work. Oh, yes. Good evening. Before I start this presentation, I would just like to personally thank, and on behalf of a lot of the CT teachers that we um, that I represent, this board and under Dr. King Cannon's leadership have really experienced some comfort during this COVID time. And I appreciate the board and Dr. King Cannon and her leadership working with Providence. My teachers express that to me often. So I wanted, since I don't talk to you very much, I wanted to make sure I got that piece in. But thank you very much for your leadership as a board with Dr. King Cannon and doing everything you can to keep us safe and make us feel safe. So thank you very much. So good news. Um, uh, back we had a meeting when Dr. King Cannon arrived and we talked about um, the design thinking process and this idea came up of growing our own teachers. So she tasked me, my first big task from her was to look into finding a Waco SD P Tech Academy that we could grow our own students to become teachers. This mask is really hard to. Okay, so what is a P Tech? A P Tech is an early college high school model where students work with businesses, and through this process, they get dual, dual credit so that an associate's earned, and then they also receive a um, some type of endorsement, not endorsement, I'm sorry, workforce certification. And then they also, with this company that's our partner, have the opportunity to have, um, not necessarily be hired, but have priority in interviewing for jobs. So as we looked at this program, we realized that we could use this for our teaching program and that the, the company would be Waco ISD. And so that's kind of how we began the process. These are some of the six components of the um, P-TECH Academy. It includes having this workforce relationship, obviously with Waco ISD, earning dual credit, and also earning that workforce certification. And so it fed in perfectly to what the group on the design thinking had in mind, and so we began to work. Um, when our students go through this P-TECH Academy, they will complete the pathway of early child, or education and training pathway that we have established at both the University and Waco High. The students will stay on campus for some of those courses. They'll begin to work in associates. At the end of the time that they finish the four years, they will actually have an associates of education. And this is a real important thing. Oftentimes, when you look at dual credit, you cannot take certain courses out if you're not a designated early college high school. So they have their list of courses that anyone can do dual credit, and then there's a list of courses that are only for early college. Those education and training courses for that associates in education would fall under those. And so our students will be able to take that, and they will actually earn through these courses. They'll get a, a teacher aid one certification. They'll actually have their first certification to go out and be a teacher's aide if they choose to. So they'll graduate in four years with an aid certificate and also an associate's in education. Then they will move because of the university center there at MCC and some of this work, whether it's Texas Tech or perhaps Charlton, all that is still in the works because this is a planning grant. Those students will actually be able to go on to a four-year university and within two years come back to the district as a teacher. So they are looking at a bachelor's degree you know, getting in the $40,000 range for salary within two years after graduation. Pretty exciting. Um, so we also, this is a very interesting um, piece of documents that we have for supporting this. And so this is that continuum that the Texas Workforce Solution, who is one of our partners with this grant, they see this continuum as important. This is a continuum where students are constantly bettering themselves as they go through the process they're getting a high wage, uh, high demand occupation and being a teacher. We're going to benefit from it because our students can come back to us and become to work for us really within two years of graduation, which I think is, I would have loved that if I had been a teacher at the time. So the grant was in, it's a planning grant. 
It's in the a sum of $111,587. They could just round it up, but that's what the amount is. Um, in this grant, we will include a summer bridge program. We want to make sure as we work with these eighth graders who are looking at going through this program that they have what it takes to do dual credit, that they're ready, they're on target, that their career goals are in line, that they kind of understand what they're getting into. We will do some activities, perhaps working at summer school, perhaps going in and seeing what that's really like to make sure that those students are ready for those programs. It includes marketing. It includes staff development for not only our teachers within Waco ISD, but our MCC partners who will be presenting dual credit all of a sudden to a 14-year-old you know, as opposed to a 21-year-old. So that's, that's a difference. And so we'll have those. It also, we put in some technology money so that the students can have, although we're doing one-to-one, -one, we may do need different laptops and working with MCC, so we put that in place. And then I'm having bleh, And also some curriculum materials to support what we're doing. So that's how we'll spend this first $111,000. In the fall of 2021, we will start our marketing. We'll start uh, talking to eighth graders. We'll go through the spring. We'll have family nights, lots and lots of parent interaction. We want parents to understand your child is starting a four-year associate's degree program. What does that look like? What do we expect of your child? What is it are the extra things that you're going to have to do to be successful? And so we'll work through that. The summer, first summer bridge program will be in the summer of 22. And then our first cohort will start that program when they begin high school in the fall of 20, uh, 2022. So that's this year of planning, getting all the, making sure they understand the marketing. We may do some tests to make sure they have the aptitude to become a teacher. We just want to make sure that as a student begins this commitment of being in college while they're in high school, they really know what they're doing and they have the ability to do that. That's a quick and easy uh, explanation. I'd love to entertain any questions that you might have. I don't have any questions, but I just think it's really exciting that we're doing this. Um, I mean, I, it was a big part of the design thinking session from, you know, a little bit over a year ago now, and that it's come to fruition so quickly. It's just, I mean, it's really exciting for me as, you know, just for our community, for our students. I think it's, it's going to be a really great piece to have here. I'm really excited, too. Any other comments or questions? Uh, Mrs. Houston was in the, she came and attended part of the design thinking mm -hmm. session was set in my group and we had such a great time um, visiting with MCC and, and uh, Tarleton. I think some of the University Center folks were there and um, we pulled in, Josh, we were, Josh was in my group too, we, were, we just pulled them right in and we, they just could align those courses so easily and so this is just really exciting to me. I, um, I have a dream that we'll have this early college high school on the MCC campus one day and um, we're not there yet but this is a start to launch that and uh, you know I want to I want to see a high school campus on the college campus mm -hmm. where kids can walk right down the sidewalk and begin to take those courses um, and beyond that you know, we heard a lot as we studied our teacher retention issues that we could keep people who became educators, people from our community who became educators, and sometimes when people came from other places was when we couldn't retain them. So I'm excited that we can take our high school kids and push them um, through a program like this um, and develop and grow our own teachers. Probably best grow your own program out there, I would think. As a Waco ISD uh, graduate, I couldn't agree with you more. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, you know, and I, when we sh I shared with Dr. Cannon by text, I mean, that we, Ken Cannon, that we had this, her first thing she sent back to me was the picture of the graphic that y'all had made. And so very exciting to see the dreams from that session moving into something that we'll be able to give to our students. Are the uh, teachers uh, going to need special extra training uh, for that pathway and everything? They will actually be utilizing the McLennan Community College for some of the dual credit. But what we'll do is we'll do some training of our teachers on campus to make sure that what they're doing on those campus-based courses are in line so that when we do our practicum experiences that 
that verbiage between what they're learning at MCC and what we're learning at Waco ISD will be the same. Well, and well, just like the dual credit courses, the teachers have to be certified to be teaching the college courses yes, at sir. the same time, That's right? right. Uh, do we have a, uh, is there going to be a limit, uh, you, you know, of how many you get? We're going to get as many as possible in there. I would take as many as, I mean. Well, I, I know I wanna, you will. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to say this. I want to take, when they say as many as possible, I want as many as possible who are prepared and ready to enter the program as possible. I don't want to fill it with numbers just to have numbers. I want the kids who come through this program to be prepared for dual credit, to be prepared to earn an associate's degree, and what that takes, because that's important, that these kids are ready. It does not to say that they get through it and they say, well, this isn't really what I wanted, and they change their mind, but we want them to be well-informed, well-prepared before they start. It's a big commitment to get a high school degree and an associate's degree side by side. I want them to be ready for that. Well, you're going to start hitting the uh, seventh graders, uh, preparing them for the eighth grade. And that, now, that's going to be going on every year. You every get them year. in the seventh yeah, grade this is that just, summertime. Yes, sir. And this will be the first cohort. So as we're starting the first cohort, we'll be starting that same process that we'll start this fall with okay. the next year's eighth graders and moving forward. Well, I think, I think, I think it's better than sliced bread, as they say. And, uh, <laughs> And I, I'm just hoping that our kids and our parents realize how important this is and what a great investment it would be into a child's life to be prepared coming out of high school. As I told the parent, uh, if you go over to Guama, your kid can learn how to well and you can kick him out of the house because he can have a job next week. So, <laughs> so this, this is going to be another pathway for, uh, for our students. And I hope, I hope that they realize uh, what, what we what we provide for them. Yeah, and MCC to me, they've really been incredible partners to Waco ISD and I didn't I didn't hesitate to talk about my dream because they are supportive of that dream. Um, and they're truly fantastic partners. Uh, and and had they not been at the table with us in at the Design Thinking Institute, we wouldn't have gotten there in the thinking because they, they're at Londa, is her last name? Londa Carabo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she could just, uh, she knew those courses pulled <laughs> and she could tell us how to make it all work. Mm -hmm. And it was really kind of fun to watch her, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's an exciting, it's a definitely exciting, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, Donna, clearly you're posturing for more recognition at the state and national level. <laughs> <laughs> this is fantastic. I love Waco ISD, and um, you know what is most important as we move into our new administration. They love our Waco kids as much as this Waco native does, and so it's a been a it's been a delight to have that. And so I really do appreciate you. I've known many of you longer than either one of us want to admit, <laughs> but I will say that it's a joy. I mean, I love my job. I love working in our new administration. And I sincerely meant that that what you've done as a board this last year and making us feel safe and allowing us to continue the work, not just to stop and say, oh, it's COVID, we gotta stop. We didn't stop. And this administration, this board has led us to this point. So thank you, because you didn't know in the background you were actually pushing us forward to things like this. Well, this is tremendous. And this, we're looking forward to uh, hearing more and seeing the results at the end. It's gonna be exciting, thank you very much. I wanna mention one more thing about uh, one of the goals in the grant was to increase our um, diversity of our yes. teacher applicant pool and have more students of color in these programs so we can increase our diversity in our teaching staff. And I think Absolutely. we can do that using our kids here locally. Yeah. So, so I'm happy. smiling behind the mask, so thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. I like how Dina was like, no, she goes first with all that data. And again, I got a tough act to follow. I, I, think, I think this is a test of my skills. Okay, last time we were together, we talked about the impact of COVID on K-8. And the reason we separated the two is because there's a great deal of historical data in the elementaries and middle schools. They, they gather a lot more data. And in high school, that kind of changes because it's a different system. So I pulled some things together for you to get a sense of how things are going at high school. 
So the data I used was attendance and credit completions for the 2019-20 school year and this year. So I have data from both. Edmentum performance, Edmentum is our credit recovery software. So when a student has to repeat a class, most times they'll repeat the sections on Edmentum. The STAR end of course assessments from December this year. The Renaissance data is the first time we've tested the high schoolers on a screener. And we have beginning of year and middle of year data on that. And then the TCAs, the taught curriculum assessments. The limitations to sharing this data with you is that approximately 33% of high school students are remote. And I consider that a limitation because it's hard to pick out what's the effect of a remote learner and what's not. But when you see some of the numbers that are quite high, I want you to keep in mind that this is not solely, I don't want perception to be reality, this is not solely a remote learner problem. We're having difficulty with the students who are in person as well. Approximately 17% of the high school students are chronically absent. That means 20 or more absences in a semester. So there's a great deal of absenteeism going on at the high schools. Of the 4,000 students, 30 to 50% don't have Renaissance data from both sides. So this was a similar problem to what we saw in the elementary and middle school, is that data gathering is challenging. And then the number of high school students who did not show up for their December EOCs, almost all of these children are retesters, and they have to pass to graduate. That rule has not been waived in any way. So these numbers are a little bit rattling. 307 kids still need English 1. 315 in English 2, 138 need Algebra 1, 170 Biology, and 83 U.S. History. And to give you some perspective on that, the students who would have tested last spring were waived. So none of these children are kids who took the classes and ended in that class when during the COVID time or even in the summer. These are kids who've been retesting for quite some time. Okay. So let's talk about credit loss, passing the class. So graduation requires a combination of passing courses with attendance requirements and passing the EOC assessments. At this point right now, TEA has not made any adjustments to these requirements for this school year. So our 2021 kids are under the traditional, traditional normal rules to graduate. So with that in mind, we looked at the data from the fall of 2020. So this is this past semester. And so these are some big numbers. These are bigger than our typical stats. For grade nine for University in Waco High, 56% of the credits taken were lost. So over half the classes were failed. For grade 10, it was 53%. 11, it was 53%. And grade 12 is 45%. So these are the children in these grade levels losing credit for either the grades or for the attendance. To dig a little deeper, the grade level that stood out in Waco High was their grade nine. And that's kind of traditional, but the stats you don't have in front of you is that Waco High, their biggest number was 71% of the ninth grade credits were lost. So 70. And at university, this one stands out, grade 11, 80% of the credits were lost from the class of 2022. So something that's happening in the background is a lot of our juniors and seniors are going to work. And they're either doing it for the family or because of the time that they're opening up to themselves with virtual, they're out there working. And as a teenager, they don't see long term the way that we do. So it's become a challenge in that area. Really yeah. Credit to compare this to what we traditionally deal with, because we have always had a credit loss problem. Overall, looking at the fall of 2019, before any COVID at all, Waco High had 30% 30 of credits lost in the whole building, and university had 26%. So there's always been a credit loss issue at the schools, but you can see, and I even put up there the taper, we have a 20% retention rate in our ninth grade for the past few years in our taper. Retention at high school is not we hold them back a grade, it's that you don't have enough credits to become a 10th grader. So 20% was already kind of an issue for us, so now it's, it's all the grade levels. And so this just represents it in a different way, the course completions. But um, the good news is things are starting to get a little bit better because to some extent the kids did not believe that they were truly going to be accountable for the failures and the lack of work. You know, they, they thought, well, it's COVID and they'll give me this chance and that chance, as teenagers do, and then they're kids. But 
once the fall grades hit and were official, the counselors started getting some calls from parents and from kids, and they invited some students back who were struggling with virtual and said, come on home, back to in-person learning, you know, because we really need you back here, so. So recovery, thinking about the admentum process. So we have this credit loss, which is compounded by the credit loss we'd already been having systemically. So how are students performing in admentum where credits are recovered? When a student fails a class, we have two choices. They're either re-enrolled in that class or we utilize admentum. This is a decision point that we have to make based on data and student needs, because not every kid, you put them on the computer, they'll be able to redo the class. Some of them need to repeat the class, but I'm sure you can imagine what that would do to class sizes if we put all these students who needed to recover it back in the classrooms with the first time kids. So the credit losses you saw at University of Wakefield High was very high this fall. And the top four classes that needed to be recovered this past fall, both high schools consistently, was the fall of English 1, English 2, 3, and 4. So I want you to keep that in mind when we get to the Renaissance data and we talk about reading levels because you'll be able to see that connection there. So this is also slow going and has a participation problem. So you can see the students enrolled in Admentum, we do it by cohort because time towards graduation is ticking. So the classes of 2021 at both high schools obviously have the most seats, the most need. And as we go down by cohort, there's fewer and fewer students because they have a few years for us to course correct or make up the credits. So you can see that more students in Waco High are enrolled in these areas. Credits complete as of March 5th. So all these students are enrolled in these courses, but at this point at university, only 52 half credit courses have been finished up to March. So we still have this participation problem. It's not being solved by you're making up the face-to-face -face in Admentum. It's just the same problem lagging in a different place. So, well, then there's star testing. So students are required to take five EOC exams. They may only fail two to qualify for what's called an IGC. So we still have individual graduation committees. The state requires face-to-face -face testing. So that's a challenge. And Wake YSD, we are going to be using, and we did for December, online testing and all the spacing. So there's lots of planning going on in Tammy Weathorn's department for testing because the students have to, even if they were virtual learners, they have to come in and take it, compounded with the kids' belief that what happened last year will happen this year, that the test will be canceled and it will be waived. And there's every indication that that is absolutely not going to happen. So three through eight, if the kid doesn't take it, it's, it's not a stopgap to, to promotion or anything like that. However, these, the high schoolers, they need to pass it to graduate. And so not showing up for it or not showing up prepared or not participating is causing a backlog. So think about what I said about the English classes. Two out of four English classes have an end of course exam. So if the kids weren't doing the work, what's that correlation gonna look like with their ability to pass the EOC? So for the end of course exams by campus, uh, students must pass the EOCs to graduate, even the class of 2021, to qualify for what's called an IGC, an Individual Graduation Committee. A student must test at least once in the subject year. So they have to actually sit and take the test. Then if they fail it and they qualify, then we can do the graduation committee. When students who earn credit in EOC exams <clears throat> spring and summer 2020, they got the waiver from the governor. They, got the, they never have to take those. So the freshmen are super lucky. Like the class of 2023, last year's freshmen, I mean, they hit the jackpot because most of them will never have to do Algebra I, Biology, and English I. They're exempt from those. So, but the other grade levels that were above them were retesters. And so they're still stuck in that retest loop. So on this chart, the, on the very right is almost the most important statistics we're back to the percent who actually showed up to take the test. So for this one, for US history, we had less than half show up at any of our high schools. And then if you look all the way to the left, you'll see the percent of students who took it but didn't pass. So it's still causing a problem even through there. This one has small numbers to it, so percents are kind of tricky when you talk about it. The next slide I have is Algebra one and Biology. And on those, again, all the way to the right, you'll see low numbers for students showing up to even take the test. 
And then on the left of those who did come to take it, you could see the Algebra 1 scores that 71% at university didn't pass, 75% at Wake High didn't pass, and 86% at Brazos. So there, the, even the ones who are showing up, there's a lag in their, their ability to pass the tests. Biology has similar numbers, even lower participation, because they're in the 20s. And then there's the English tests. You can see on the, all the way to the right, the third column in that says total number of students tested, you'll see that those numbers for the English tests are very large. They are very large statewide. So the English 2 test is the most failed EOC across the state. So this is not uncommon compared to other districts. But now when we look to the left, out of all these numbers of children, we have U at University had 75% not pass, Wake High was 80, and Brazos is 77. So that's going to, again, be problematic, and it holds true for the English too as well. Now Brazos, things were a little different for them because they usually get retesters. Students usually go to them in their junior, senior year, and if they pass, they don't have to take it again. But you'll see the yellow represents their statistics from retesters which are low, but in the pink is because there's times when a kid is so credit deficient, like they'll go to Brazos with five credits and they'll take some of these classes for the very first time at Brazos. So that's the pink represents that they usually get, especially U.S. history, because it's a junior class, that if they take it for the first time, the Brazos separates those scores for their accountability purpose, but just for perspective. These are our retesters and these are our first time testers. So my next question is, what about the class of 2021? For personal reasons, the class of 2021 is important to all of us. They've been through a great deal. But from an accountability standpoint, the class of 2021 makes up our 2022 rating. And if the state's already taken a hard line with testing, I'm pretty sure what it's going to look like for accountability in 2022. We'll be back to being held accountable. And our graduation rate is something we've been trying to work on. So the class of 2021, I asked the cohort teams to give me some statistics. So of the class of 2021, those who lost credit purely due to attendance. So at university, that was 27% of the kids, and at Wake Bible, I was 38. The kids passed the class, but had more than 20 absences in the fall semester. Those who are behind grade level is actually an improved stat. So 13 of them are behind and 45 at Waco High. That's actually improvement from past years because we're trying to get kids pushed towards that piece. Transferred to Brazos, so remember we talked early in the year, I presented to you the changes we made at Brazos. It is now we're starting to see a streamline with Brazos. And so <clears throat> universities has sent 17 students there. Waco High has sent 11 students there. So we're gonna have to calibrate that a little bit because you can see Waco High is having a greater need right now. So we're gonna have to, when we talk in cohort meetings, kind of shift for Brazos to be the support for some of these Waco High students. And those not yet eligible for an IGC, means the kids on path for graduating with credits, but they have more three or more tests they failed. At university, that's nine students, and at Waco High, that's 23. And I wanna remind you, the kids who were on cohort, the 12th graders, a few slides back, they lost 45% of their credits. So we're, we're looking at the urgency needing to start to fill in for them. Brazos we've been working on. So what is it? where do they stand in terms of graduation? Now remember, Brazos is under improvement for graduation rates. There's been some very specific steps we've taken, and this is where we're seeing some progress. So the Brazos principal comes to the University of Waco High cohort meetings where the AP and the counselor meet to discuss a kid needs to transfer. So, they're, so she's there to hear their story, to hear what they need, what has been tried, what interventions, all of that. Brazos has already graduated 28 students since the beginning of this year. So as soon as a kid is done at Brazos, they are graduated. We verify them and we graduate them. And what that does is free up more seats for her to be able to take students who might be in need. And then 45 students have transferred to Brazos after cohort team meetings. They are from the 2021, 2022, and 2023 cohorts. The 2023 cohort are um, students who have, ch have babies because they have the health care to help them. So they may very well go back to the regular campus, but they're benefiting now. Reading and math data, I'm going to share some renaissance with you using this data. 
Renaissance is a measure at high school of foundation. How strong is the foundation of the students in reading and math? It does go all the way to 12th grade. So if, I, if you were tested in Renaissance or an adult tested in Renaissance, it would look like a 12 plus. So I want you to keep that in mind when I show you these numbers that it's testing the foundation all the way up to college. First problem is what we had in K-8, is kids participating to get us the data we need for them. So in the beginning, the 51 and 46% of the students didn't even test. But as with K-8, through eight, we got improvement in the middle of the year, so 31 and 33% of the students. I put a note on there about validity, because on the slide, when we talked about K-8 through eight last time, there were some tests that we invalidated because they thought, well, this kindergartner doesn't really have an eighth grade reading level and they were home, so maybe we need to retest them. But in this case, neither high school asked to have any kids retest. And so it looks like this. That first column is number of students tested are the kids who actually have the both scores, the beginning of year and the mid-year. And so the average reading grade level at Brazos was a 6.4 and then a 5.5. And so it's not falling because it's the kids, it's because she's got an in and out, right? When you think about it, like, one student's coming in and she's graduating another. So the kids she had are not necessarily, they're the kids who took it in two places, but if they took it at university for the beginning of the year and now they're with her, they may not be the strongest. But universities kept flat with the seventh uh, grade reading level and so is Waco High. So I think that helps you understand some of the literacy things we're doing in the lower grades to boost that up. For math, we have the grade level equivalence for Brazos is approximately seventh grade. And for university, it's approximately ninth grade and Waco High approximately ninth grade. So we're seeing a trend that shows us a district trend across all grade levels. But with math, we have to look a little deeper because it's measuring the math foundation, but math is different than reading and writing. Reading and writing is a spectrum and the more you do it, the stronger you get with guidance. But math, if no one ever teaches you what an isosceles triangle is, you don't learn that intuitively. So there, there's some direct instruction that can be a support here. So what I'm gonna do is show you some percentiles. So percentiles you might be familiar with from uh, like SAT, ACT, or that way. So this is Renaissance data and a percentile is the student's ability compared to other kids, same grade, nationally. And so the examples I gave you is a student with a percentile rank of 85 performed as well as or better than 85% of the kids who took the test. Conversely, a kid with a 30 performed at or better, at or below the 30%. So that's the key here when we look at the district's reading. So focusing on that mid-year, 61% of our high schoolers across are below the 25th percentile nationally. So this is the districts, and you can see that next spot, 25th to 49. So approximately 86% of our kids at the high schools, university, and Waco High together are below the 50th percentile. Here are university's numbers. And you can see how they are pointing because that requires intense remediation, but it's not unexpected in the COVID year. And remember, our kids are being compared with other kids this year. So these national statistics are not just isolated like our kids compared to the usual norm. These are our kids compared to other kids nationally right now. So then there's the math. The math looks a little bit better. Again, because it's a little more skill-based so we can target. And so here by mid-year, um, we have 34% below the 25th and 23%. And then I broke down universities and Waco Highs as well, which the two high schools seem to be moving in sync there. So this one, I'm gonna show you a little bit of reading data. It's the TCAs, but I give you the math data to point out that Renaissance is holistically testing it. And when a teacher is teaching like poetry, that's different. It's a unit that they're gonna assess and see how students did. So that what the TCAs do is, from the curriculum department, they're assessments of that unit at that time so that you can respond immediately with changed instruction. So we looked at these for the lower grades, but I'll show you for the Englishes. This is looking by unit. So in that first English one unit, up to poetry, the TCA, 61% of the kids were, did, uh, did well or passed 
the first one, and then the second unit is 56, and the third is 55. This is the data teachers would use for instruction because it's their kids taking a test right now on this moment in curriculum. And so you'll be able to see the same stats for English 2, English 3, and English 4. And then when you look, the algebra statistics are there. We looked at those last time because they do include the eighth grade, but you can see some of the struggles there. But if you look at that first unit, 75% of the kids scored approaches. So the, the instruction in that unit was pretty strong. But then when you look again, the second unit is only 57. Well, that tells you that there's something in that taught curriculum in that unit that we need to go back and teach. So the TCAs give teachers some very targeted data. But for the other higher math classes, this will be actions Dina talks about moving forward because we have checkpoints for the upper level maths right now because I'm just super impressed by all of the curriculum department that they were able to get so many of the TCAs written to be used during this year in a COVID world. So this is an action step we're going to have to take in the future is these are checkpoints, but they're very far apart. So when you look at that geometry, it's very deep into the year. So figuring out which skill the kids need remediation on requires some extra digging. So what one of the steps that we'll be taking is building a little more incremental unit assessments for those. All right, it's all you, Dina. Good evening. Um, similar to last time, I'm just going to uh, quickly go over our next steps and the work that we're going to continue um, and then work that we will add to, to support this process next year of, of addressing our student needs. So as Ms. Bell showed, um, we do have a lot of students who are in need of credit recovery. So credit recovery will continue to be um, an ongoing focus and process. Currently, students are able to do that um, on campus, um, in our top labs, in different you know, situations, we'll have summer school, of course, where they can um, recover credit there as well. Um, and we don't have a lot of students attending this right now, but we do have the community tutoring sites, and students are able to come um, to those sites to get additional help, to spend time um, making up work, um, coursework, and even attendance time. And so we are struggling a bit to get our secondary students um, to attend those. Um, that speaks to the attendance recovery. Um, right now we do have Saturday diversion. It's virtual, but um, students can recover attendance hours um, through that process as well. Um, just as with elementary, um, Courtney Parnell, who is um, over our intervention um, department, she has developed a multi-tiered system of support, which oftentimes you hear us refer to as RTI, but it does have a new name, which is MTSS. And so we developed a protocol and a system for that this year. However, it's been harder to implement, of course, with students in multiple settings. And um, as you know, we're looking at um, our staffing for that next year to ensure that we have the proper resources on campus to implement those things effectively. At the high school, that looks a little bit different. Um, than it does at the elementary campus, but we begin master scheduling here um, in the next week or so, and scheduling in those interventions as a part of the master schedule will be um, a part of the process. You see there it says when time. I don't know if when time is actually what we will call it, um, but here on this slide it stands for what I need time. Right now university is in, um, university high school is incorporating um, a 20 minute extended block of time. They've just kind of robbed time from here and there where all students are working on some intervention in the middle of the day. But um, next year we're looking to put um, a 30 minute block to where students could work on intervention or extension. So students who maybe need to, to study um, for AP exams or ACT or SAT or different things like that. So it wouldn't just be intervention. And that's why right now it has the title of what I need. Um, time. Master scheduling, of course, um, I just mentioned. Um, reallocation of the Title I funding, um, we've discussed before, so just ensuring that our campuses are properly staffed to be able to offer the things that we need to offer to work on um, this recovery process. Um, 
special program staffing structures to increase support. Um, Grace Benson is working on our um, programs for our ESL students in both middle school and high school. So she's developed curriculum through our ELDA and ELLA courses there. Um, and really looking at how, you know, how can we strengthen that to help those students. But then also um, Charlotte Davis, who's director of special education, is looking at um, how the resource classrooms are used at the high school and ensuring that we have that um, in a really good place heading into next year, as well as our inclusion support. And then continue to refine the cohort system. We've talked about that before. They've put that in place at the high schools. We have our cohort counselors now and cohort APs. Um, but extending that, and we have now invited um, representatives from the bilingual education department, representatives um, from our other special populations, which would be Dr. Wigtill um, for our foster um, students who are in foster care and maybe homeless. Um, and um, special education, I do a blank there for a second, so that when we have students who are receiving um, or who are in programs and we do see that they're failing or they have absences or, you know, different things are going on, that there's a representative there who then can connect with, say, for special education, their case manager to say, okay, what have we done? You know, what do you know about this student? Are you aware that they're failing? How can we help them? Have we intervened? Have we met? And so tightening up that system through the cohort system um, is gonna be critical now. And th that is, is happening now and beginning, but just continuing to refine that um, moving through the year. Um, continued work, um, we are continuing to revise our um, assessments. We tackled some curriculum last year, of course, but didn't, you know, write new curriculum or new assessments for all subject areas. So that will be a continued process, developing assessments that we don't have and refining the ones that we do. Um, ongoing training and support um, for lesson development, alignment, and differentiation. We started that this year. Um, of course, all teachers, um, every teacher in the district actually had training around that um, but as we know, we've had challenges, and so all of the things that, you know, that we've implemented, um, which I'm very proud of as a district and, and a department, um, that we've managed to keep trudging along with those things, but as we know, um, nothing has been able to be implemented with quite the fidelity that we would hope um, this year. So continued pro professional development and DDI, um, you know, that, that follows along with everything. That's going to be very important, just as we talked about when we discussed this same information in the elementary presentation, because um, intervention is more than just putting a student on a program or, you know, in a classroom and calling it intervention. It's going to be really important to determine and figure out exactly the gaps that they do have and address that. Um, ongoing professional development around action coaching. That is the part to where we're working with our leaders and, you know, helping them coach our teachers around developing that good, strong instruction in the classroom. That will also be supported by the instructional specialists on campus um, that we've been talking about as well and ensuring that those um, folks are um, equipped to, to do that work. And then develop and implement year one literacy professional development for middle school. So um, I've presented to you before about our literacy plan. We began last year with elementary, and that was year one. And so now we're in year two of the overall plan, but uh, middle school comes in this coming year into their year one. And so at the middle school levels, we will have our ELAR classrooms double blocked. So they'll be a bit longer. And um, that will provide teachers time to do some tier two instruction within their classroom. Now with that, that's, that takes training um, because um, you know, having a longer class at the elementary or high school level um, is different. And so what do we do with that time? And so we have to be sure that we're using that time effectively. So that will come with um, professional development as well. And that's it. Any questions? As if that wasn't enough, right? <laughs> no questions? I think uh, okay. the report highlights the work we've got to do. 
to bring our kids up all the way from kindergarten to high school. Um, we certainly have challenges with COVID and credits and high school kids working and motivation. Uh, motivation is a, a big problem right now with COVID. Um, just That's so probably truly our biggest problem and a lot of the reasons why we're seeing many of the deficits we are. It's not that online instruction can't be successful, but it isn't successful if we're not, you know, participating in it. And so that that's really a, a huge issue. Well, I think it's um, a systemic problem. It didn't just happen with COVID. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got... Um, mm -hmm. I think our, our dropout rate is indicative of that. Mm -hmm. It's those systems and structures to support instruction that we've been working to put in place. So I'd like to have Dina come back in April and just talk to you about literacy initiatives and what she has done, mm -hmm. she and her team have done so far and where we're headed so we can get a full picture for you of the work that's mm -hmm. being done. Dr. King Kelly, yes. I know that uh, some of the uh, complaints that I have heard from parents is that uh, Online instruction is not helping, and for one thing, they can't help their students, and that is part of the problem. And there is no way we can go into a house and show a parent how to how to do whatever we need to get done. And I, I've said this publicly before. I know the first time we voted on this, I voted against in person, but I now see the fact that we need more in person than anything else, and especially with some stuff that, that y'all have presented here tonight, our students are hurting and we got to catch up and save them. And if it means forcing them back to school, well, I'm all for forcing them back into the classroom because that's where they need to be. Yeah. And we're going to have to make some decisions about that for the fall. Um, we don't have any official TEA guidance on whether or not, um, uh, or how kids would qualify for remote instruction. But I hear that they're going to tighten that up, um, and we'll have to make some decisions as a district. I can tell you we want our kids in our school buildings learning. And I think our today. teachers do, too. You know, they're at the very beginning, we were all in a different place, and there was a level of fear, as there should have been, right? I mean, we this was new, and, and we were, you know, no vaccine, lots of different things. And so um, we're in a different place now. Um, and I do think, you know, people had justified fears, but, but I think it's different. We have to get them, we have to get them back. So it is, I've said it before, but it makes my shoulders tight. Like, I'm just, ah, uh, you know, because um, everybody is working so hard. You know, the, your teachers and everyone, they're just really working hard. Um, and so many times they've said, you know, in their off periods or whatnot, calling kids and trying to get in touch with people, and oftentimes, you know, not successfully. And so the the time that it takes for that, and and then unable to reach. And then our PCLs are going out. Um, our parent community liaisons on campuses are going out and trying to find kids, um, and knock on doors, and you know, do those things. But in some instances, they're not there. Um, whether they've relocated or, you know, not all instances, of course, but some. Well, we want our students back. And I think, you know, second and third round of stimulus funds, hopefully we'll have um, <laughs> a, a good uh, majority of those funds that are already allocated that we can see to the district, even if we got a, a nice portion of them. We're going to have some additional funding for interventions and um, some work to help catch up so mm -hmm. I'm excited about that and we're working on a plan mm -hmm. to to use and those funds when and when they become available mm -hmm. right it's a it's over it looks like over 70 million for Waco ISD it's based on our title one counts um, and, but we don't know how much of that the state will keep and uh, how much of that we'll get. Yeah. Madam President. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Kornblum, I know that uh, these numbers uh, feel like a mountain of a task mm. to uh, tackle, but I, I really appreciate um, the scope 
with which you're trying to resolve the issue. And I know that motivation is a big, um, yeah, it, it, this, uh, COVID just, uh, emphasized mm-hmm. kind of what we, what we had kind of <laughs> known and seen. Um, you know, I, I would love is the tutoring stuff. I, I think there's a way that we can maybe even push out that information, whether it be to local churches, community mm-hmm. leaders that we know, is there a way that we can, Mr. Witcher? Where are you? You have those flyers, correct? That we could get to them? Yeah, if we could maybe just get like one or two of those and then we can start kind of <laughs> at least spreading the word because I think that, you know, if it, this really is going to take kind of a community effort, you know. So I, I know uh, that we re- just getting the word out. I know communication is mm-hmm. always kind of hard sometimes to get everyone <laughs> knowledgeable of what's happening but if there's if there's some way that we as a board can also help uh, you in this and help our students because ultimately we want to serve our students mm-hmm. I think uh, uh, piggybacking on what you're saying is that uh, COVID has caused a lot of the churches to not do anything that's part of the problem I think that once we go back to some sense of normalcy well, then, you know, because there was a lot of churches that did have mentor groups and uh, 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 study groups and stuff like that. But uh, everybody, you know, because of the of distance and regulations and everything, everything has stopped. Uh, even my church, you know, we, we used to go help South Waco. But, uh, and, and, and that also is part of the problem. And that will help once we go back to some sense of normalcy where, Churches and other groups can go back in and start helping these kids. And I know another thing I heard a lot of our retired teachers, they didn't want to come in to help right. that, uh, that mentor or study. That affects also. our substitutes, too. You right, they didn't that want same thing. Mm-hmm. So, 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 I mean, I guess we can say we know what the problem is, mm-hmm. but what's the solution? And the solution won't happen until we catch COVID and knock it out or have, have a better control over it and let people feel a little bit safer and gathering together. So, because all it's doing is making your job, all, all the teacher's job, just making your job hard. Yeah, but to speak to Norman, and then I'll stop. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, you know, these groups, these church groups, these mentoring groups, they might not be meeting, but they have the relationship. Mm-hmm. So if yeah. we can give them that information and they can make a phone call, you know, I think that is where we kind of need to start mm-hmm. really kind of using the collective mm-hmm. community. So please, so I would love yeah. to have that tutoring information. I'd love to get it in people's hands so that they can then disseminate it out to parents and teachers. And maybe they can make the phone call mm-hmm. to the parent and say, hey, want to make you aware of this, you know, whether mm-hmm. it's in English or in Spanish. I think I just think that we have relationships that were developed because we had a wave of mentoring and and volunteerism and people really wanting to get engaged in the community and from the community in the schools that had to stop because of COVID. But this is one way we can start re-engaging, re-engaging mm-hmm. the community to help our students, you know, so. Well, we definitely invite all of the help that we can get. And so we will get you those flyers. Okay, yes, yes, yes. And mm-hmm. we're going to help ourselves by putting structures and systems mm-hmm. in place for staff development and staffing mm-hmm. interventions and yeah. curriculum development mm-hmm. and we need to have stability in all of those things mm-hmm. and not bounce around from program to program mm-hmm. um, it, so that we can see the results of the work that right. we're doing. Yeah. And you, I mean, you all know that we were already working and focusing on a lot of things directed at that work specifically anyway and that, and then here we are. And so it's still, like Dr. Kincannon said, yes and. It's still all of that and all of this. And I also think, um, Ms. Cordwick, to your point, I not just rounding it up now, I, I almost think, too, because we were talking about this earlier at registration, that school's back. You know, we're, we're, that is, there's almost going to be sort of a, you know, we do pre-K roundup, almost like a just student roundup come, come time for school to start again to say we're back and to get them back in school for kids who may not have been engaging for quite some time. But, you know, yeah. Okay, well, thank you.
<laughs> a meeting is Monday night. Thank you, Madam President. Earlier this evening, we talked about the facilities planning process and the community advisory committee meetings. That next community advisory committee meeting is, of course, on Monday. And anyone who wants to join in and hear that conversation can watch the meeting live at wacoisd.org slash CAC meeting. All together is one word. We also are really excited because next Tuesday, University High School's One Act Play heads to the by district competition. We're incredibly proud of the success that they had at the district competition and excited to see what happens at Poteet High School as they perform next week. We'll be bringing them to you to celebrate their success at recognitions in a future month. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I, I guess feel everything feels a bit more hopeful for these vaccinations are coming up mm -hmm. all over the place. But I uh, do want to say that I continue to hear from staff how grateful they have been um, that we were out in front of all that. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, you know, now that everybody seems to be getting in, I don't want anybody to forget that we, we like the groundwork and um, also have, been, have had staff appreciative uh, the work that we have to make them feel safe, which mm -hmm. is what uh, Donna Kevin was saying earlier, but y'all have been very quick um, to get information out of the community, um, where some districts have been lagging behind, um, waiting maybe to see what others were going to do, and um, most recently, when the governor made some changes, y'all were quick with information for our families and our staff, my so thank you. Thank you. Well, that was some, thank you. Great partnerships in our community, county and the city and Ascension. It's good stuff. Mm -hmm. All right, with that, we're adjourned. Great. Thank you.